Shanaz Soni here with Katya Ferris. I am very excited today to actually have this um, conversation with my friend Katya on uh, Vedic astrology and how Vedic astrology impacts our life and how it actually differentiates from uh, Western astrology. Uh, but before we go into all of that, I have to say that I met Katya actually five years ago at Aspen Lodge in Colorado, uh, attending a Star Knowledge Conference. And um, I was just very amazed by her um, diversity because she is very beautiful and she is extremely intelligent. And she's also a belly dancer and she understands like how uh, sacred geometry is being utilized in all aspects of her life. And especially being a belly dancer, she actually uh, kind of lives it in her moves, in her expression, in her communication. And uh, so, yeah, we basically um, were clicked right away as we met and, um, and we have kept in touch. And I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity to have a conversation and also um, help other people understand uh, what is the, um, you know, what is the um, meaning behind Vedic astrology? So I'm going to ask Katya, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, thank you so much, Shainaz, for having me. It's such a pleasure. And I'm so glad that you're doing this spiritual work now because you're just a natural. Thank you. Thank you're you. welcome. Um, gosh, I, my the beginning of astrology for me started when I was nine years old. Uh, my mother was one of those really cool, hip 70s moms, you know, who was listening. Well, actually, she was a jazz singer. So she was singing Helen Reddy. And she had all of her Linda Goodman's, you know, sun signs and love signs books in the house. And of course, other, you know, classic uh, Western astrology books. And from the age of nine, I was just like a sponge, you know, I couldn't wait to, well, after my parents divorced and I would visit her in Oklahoma, I couldn't wait to visit her and get to the bookshelf and just fall down the rabbit hole. And that was about, oh, 30 years, really. I mean, it wasn't until I was about 40 that I um, seriously got into Vedic astrology. And uh, when I was in my 20s, I had a really great friend who um, took me under her wing and taught me a lot of Western astrology, a uh, very beautiful Persian American woman. And um, after, like, you know, a couple of years into my teaching with her, suddenly she got into Vedic astrology and it was like my whole world, you know, my, it was like an identity crisis. And I think this is what happens <laughs> with a lot of people with Vedic astrology is they, we get so attached to our Western sun sign because see you guys, there's, you know, we use two different zodiacs. So usually you fall back a sign in your Vedic sign. And so suddenly, you know, um, my happy, fun, loving son and Sagittarian teacher turned into a very brooding and, you know, dark sun in Scorpio. And, and I just didn't understand. So it took me about 20 years, really, from the time I learned about it in my 20s until I was about 40 to accept my Vedic chart. And understanding the, dif the difference in the two systems took a long time. And I finally figured it out. And this is, this is what I think it is. Your tropical... Zodiac is what Western astrology uses. This is what everybody knows themselves as. This is when the earth is aligned with the sun. So the axis or the tilt of the earth is taken out of the equation. The earth is put upright and that makes it aligned with the sun. That is Western astrology. That shows the sunlight of a chart. Vedic astrology, for the most part, uses the sidereal zodiac. Now, there are some Vedic astrologers that use tropical, but for the most part, we use sidereal. And sidereal does not take out the wobble. It keeps it in. And the, the degree difference between this angle and zero is called the ayanamsha. It's the precession of the equinoxes, right? Because we're going like this. That's the precession of the equinoxes. And the sky changes over time. 
This is what flipped out our ancestors and their whole worlds were turned upside down because the sky looked differently, okay? Uh, that's the procession of the equinoxes. So the sidereal zodiac is when you open up your Google sky map and you're looking at the stars, that's sidereal. That shows the real time placement of the planets and the stars. So this shows the starlight of a chart. Now, in Vedic astrology, because is it, a, it is a lunar based system, we place a lot of emphasis upon the moon chart. And that's just where you take the whatever house the moon is in and you make that the ascendant, you make that the first house. So that shows the moonlight of a chart. And the truth is you guys, you need all three. <laughs> and it's taken me all these years to figure this out. You know, uh, we get so attached to our solar chart um, that we can't possibly understand how, and, and the worst ones are the ones that are like, Sun in Aries, and then they go back to Sun in Pisces. Oh, God. That's the worst person to try and convince. You're not an Aries. They're like, their whole identity is wrapped up in being this firebrand, right? And then suddenly they, you take away their, it's like you've taken their thunder away, and suddenly they're Pisces, you know, little fish or something. And But they, it, it, so it's all about the nakshatras. And this is something that you were discussing um, with me earlier. Uh, and, um, so my, in my understanding, you know, of all of this, what really, um, is the star of the Vedic system are what are called the lunar mansions or the nakshatras. And this is where we take one constellation, let's say cancer, and we divide it into two and a half parts, the actual constellation. So the stars that fall in those parts flavor those parts. And it tells you why one cancerian is different than another. So those are called nakshatras or lunar mansions. Now underneath the nakshatras are four padas or fingers or steps. And these are the steps of God. These are what takes you around the zodiac. And this is how detail oriented Vedic is. And this is what really drew me to it. Um, and because we are a lunar based system, um, you know, we place more emphasis upon your moon sign than your sun sign. So you are more your moon sign than your sun mm -hmm. sign. And you are more your nakshatra and especially your nakshatra with the pada. Uh, but we also play, place a lot of emphasis upon the eclipses. And um, the eclipses are, do you, do you understand? I, I don't know. I always explain this to people because I think a lot of people, when you say north and south node, they get like confused and they don't want to admit, I don't know what you're talking about. So <laughs> if this is the earth and this is the moon going around the earth, the most Northern point it goes to is the North node and the most Southern point it goes to is the South node. And those are the eclipse points. That's where either the earth is between the moon and the sun or the moon is between the earth and the sun. Um, and those eclipse points are, um, they're shadow points, right? They're not real planets, but because they're so important, we call them planets. So we call them Rahu for the north and K2 for the south. Imagine it's a snake and the head of the snake is Rahu and where he's cut off, um, it's like he has an open mouth and he just consumes and he consumes and he doesn't know when he's full because he doesn't have a stomach. This is the force that brings you into this life. This is your fate, your destiny, what you're here to do in this life. Um, it's all about Rahu. And K2, and it's your material ego, right? K2 is the south node of the moon. It is the body of the serpent without the head. So this is our spiritual ego. This is where we give selflessly without thinking because we don't have a head. But this is also the religious fanatic who loses his head with rage. Um, and K2 represents our past lives. It represents things that we're already good at. And K2 is, um, uh, it's the wound. So it's things you've done before, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've mastered them. It just means it's familiar territory. And in this life, if you focus too much on it, it's kind of like picking at a wound and it's never going to heal. And so, you know, K2 is uh, very touchy. You have to be 
Um, you have to use its energy wisely. And, uh, but really we're here, you know, Rahu brings you in, K2 takes you out. Right. So the forces behind Vedic astrology. And I wanted to know more about my past lives. And so <laughs> that's what got me into Vedic astrology because Western just, I kind of hit a, a dead end wall, brick wall. And they said, nope, if you want to know about, about that, you've got to go study Vedic. And so that's what I did. And um, yeah, and you know, that was, it's been a lifelong journey. And while doing this, of course, you know, I've been a dancer and a belly dancer and uh, tarot. You know, I got um, certified with the builders of the Adatum out of Los Angeles in 1989 in uh, tarot and Kabbalah. So that was something that, you know, just, you know, broadened the things I had already learned in Western astrology. Um, and then in uh, December, 2012, I finished my master's de degree in ethnomusicology and quickly discovered that I did not want to be an ethnomusicologist. <laughs> I mean, I loved, I loved what I learned. I loved uh, my professors and the whole experience, uh, but it was, um, you know, I'm a performer and I love to be uh, on my own and I didn't want to be trapped, you know, in a university setting. Um, but I was very happy to learn what I did because now I, I add it to uh, all the skills that I learned, you know, with writing and doing proper research and publishing and you know, all, you know, all of that stuff was, I didn't know it, but I was preparing myself for astrology. <laughs> right. All path leads to heaven, right? So <laughs> it sure does. And really they're both frequency-based systems, you know, music and um, the planets are, are, are entwined. You know, we call the planets, the grahas, which means to grasp because they have a literally have a, the planets have a grasp on us. And they are people. These planets are not just rocks flying through the sky or balls of gas. No, these are entities with consciousness. Exactly. exactly. And they communicate with us through quantum entanglement because we're in the same solar system. I mean, we're in the same universe, but really, I mean, we're in the same neighborhood. So they have a big influence on us. And um, once you make friends with the grahas, and make peace with your chart, then you start to bust some of those patterns that you're talking about. Right, right. And speaking of the chart, I actually had a, a recent reading with you. And it was very fun for me because, you know, the whole perspective about the whole thing about the karma and the past life, and also just the way the Vedic astrology looks at it in a much more deeper way than the Western astrology. And the very fact that Western astrology came way later than Vedic astrology, and it seems like that they kind of uh, took out some of the important aspects of it. And to me, you know, like we need to have it all together for you to understand yourself. So right. You can do better in the life you're creating because the more you right. know, the better you are. I mean, for the most part. So I absolutely. Think well, and it's all ego attachment. I mean. You know, technically, the, 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 the oldest form of astrology is from Babylon. And Babylon is actually, was actually a part of ancient Persia. So, but it wasn't written down. So the oldest written down form of astrology is Vedic, is Vedic astrology. And Vedic astrology is called Jyotisha. Jyotisha means the science of light. It is the eyes of the Veda. Um, did you want to show a chart of things that you had? Um, yes. Yes. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my understanding of okay. Vedic astrology should have a credibility, you know, from, uh, because it's kind of funny because I run into a lot of people who don't believe in astrology at all because they say, I believe in astronomy, but not astrology. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, for me having both backgrounds of science and spirituality, I like to kind of. Uh, sh share the, the fact that, you know what, there's science behind it, just like you said, planet has consciousness. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and um, share um, the screen I have. 
And um, first of all, I wanted to share a picture. Ah! <laughs> when we met five years ago, this, is, uh, uh, this was a, a quick snapshot of that. We were both happy and excited. Yes. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my understanding is that life is a play of time. So everything is in motion, every single thing. We are, uh, I mean, we are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. So we are constantly moving even within ourselves. Then we are standing on this earth, earth is moving, and earth has multiple motion. Then earth is moving around the sun, then moon is moving around the earth, and then we have all these planets around us. So we have like a very interesting dance going on and every single thing is impacting the other one and there is like a feedback loop that we're making with each other and uh, a lot of time people don't realize but earth has two types of motion one is the spin like you mentioned and then the other one is its motion around the sun and um, both of them contributes in itself like for example the moon you know when the moon is moving around the earth and we're going through this endless dance and you know we it's it's like depending on where the moon is in re reference to earth it matters in our life i mean the very fact that the lunatic the word lunatic came uh, about from the definition of uh, you know like hospitals seeing a lot of people with mental challenges on the full moon day so right the, the gravitational pull exactly so the very fact field. <laughs> yeah, the very fact that lunatic, all these names are embedded in the understanding of how everything affects everything. And one of the things that I personally think that I'm gifted at is understanding patterns. And the cycle kind of takes you closer to understanding patterns so you can uh, do what you need to do if you want to change something. And I mean, uh, similarly, moon and sun affect on tide in respect to earth. So that actually has been proven about the spring tide and the neap tide and how it interplays the role. And if you just imagine that if the tide changes, I mean, that's a pretty significant change on the way our earth is. And that makes a lot of sense for it to start affecting the entire ge geology of earth and planet is conscious, earth is conscious, we are conscious, plus we are all vibrating at a certain frequency and vibration. So there is- so a woman's lunar cycle. I mean, if we wouldn't even have babies if it weren't for the <laughs> Exactly. I mean, look at our, I mean, even menstrual period, right? I mean, it happens every yes. time days, which is the normal cycle. And when it doesn't, then usually we have a hormone imbalance and then we have to handle that. So there's all this interconnectedness um, of us with the rhythm of planets. It's just such a rich information that how can anybody ignore that? And then as Earth is moving around the sun, you know, that's how we get all our seasons. And that actually is prevalent in our lives. So there's just so many proofs that all of these cycles of earth, sun, they all kind of interplay. And Vedic basically, um, I think based on um, you were saying, like it's, uh, is it 50,000 years ago knowledge or something? That oh, well, I mean, here's the thing. <clears throat> You know, it was probably started to be written down about 50,000 years ago. <laughs> this is an oral tradition. So for, you know, that's what's up for debate is, okay, how far, how long ago, quarter million years ago, we don't know, like how old this is. It's just been given down through oral tradition. And then finally, somebody started writing it down. And you know, they didn't write it all down. <laughs> there's oh, yeah, no sure, because, you know, there's always that too, right? Because information does get... Uh, some lost in translation. So the I found this art, you know, this astrolope, which it says that it was used in ancient navigation system. It's actually uh, still residing in a museum in Geneva. And uh, they said that there is Sanskrit uh, script encrypted in all of this. And uh, so this is just one example of many that are ancient, um, you know, um, people who use Vedic astrology, they actually had a technology to actually use it to create the information that they did. And um, one of the video that you sent me, Katya, which kind of explained the little bit of a calculation and how you know the earth spin uh, that forms a circle takes about two, five, nine, two, zero years. 
uh, which has been expressed uh, by Greg Braden and Barbara Marciniak and many other people that I follow, because that is a very important number to remember on how cyclic um, everything is uh, of how human basically evolves, right? And what type of ages and stages we go through and how it's connected with like the heartbeats in our heart. And um, like, so it's all kind of very much interestingly intertwined. And the interesting thing about even the speed of light is that the Vedic were able to measure it to 186,000 miles per hour. And, um, you know, NASA and other scientists came about basically very close to a number. So it was very accurate for the fact that whatever technology they had at that time, and it still was very close to what we actually came up with. So that just shows well, that- at 432, uh, can I just say- Yes, please. That, yes. Okay. So I talked about the nakshatras, right? The lunar mansions. Yes. There are 27 of them. Now there's a mystical 28th one, but we don't use it. And this is because if you take 27 and you do, uh, multiply it by four, what do you get? Well, I'm just going to compute it. 108. Oh, yeah. 108. And 108 is the number of times that we have to do our mantras, among other things. But we always do mantras 108 times. Take 108, multiply it by four, and you have... 432, my friend. That is so and this is the resident hurts that uh, if you're a musician, you should tune your A note. Most musicians tune to four, uh, 440, but if you tune it to 432, you're actually it more in line with the uh, frequencies because it's kind of like 440 is like... Um, a radio station with a little bit of static, you know? You can hear the music coming through the radio, but there's that static. But when you hit 432, you hit that radio station dead on and it's clear as a bell. Wow, so isn't that interesting that that 432 hertz actually became more known to us like in a recent, you know, recent time frame. And all these other times we were basically kind of given the frequency of 440 which had a little bit of a static in it. So it's kind of like part of the, like part of everything, right? The numerology plays a very big role in everything. And some of the things have been a little bit tailored according to whatever the mass agenda is to keep us on a different frequency and vibration. So yeah, that's a very, that's a very good point um, you brought up. And actually when you said about 108, because I have a friend, she actually just recently did the whole 108 uh, thing because you know 108 is a very powerful number. And actually the diameter of the sun and the distance between the sun and the earth, um, I think there is a 108 relationship with that and the moon and so forth. So 108 number is also very prevalent in the Vedic um, astrology and how they actually compute all the numbers. And um, I guess uh, this is just uh, something that is very high level here because Katya is going to go through her chart and explain everything much uh, more. But one of the things that you will always hear in Vedic uh, astrology is yugas. And it's kind of interesting because right nowadays they make so many online games, you know, which kind of follows this age, you know, the golden age and the bronze age, like Empire Earth, which I personally played because it's a pretty cool game. So it kind of uh, shows the cycle, the four, uh, the four cycle, right? The Satya, the Yuga, the Treta Yuga and the Dwapara Yuga. So these are all the four cycles that, uh, basically exist and we fall in one of the cycles depending on our earth position with respect to the sun. And that dance is continually in play. And the reason this information becomes so important uh, for anyone and everyone is because depending on where we are um, in, the, in respect to all this position, the ether, which is pretty much everywhere, it has a different effect on human and how we vibrate and what well, is. yeah, it's it's more like the highest concentration of ether is at the galactic center. And it's a very, we consider it a very treacherous part of the zodiac. It is at um, about zero degrees Sagittarius, Mula Nakshatra. Mm -hmm. Mula means uh, the roots. So it's like that Shiva, you know, creation destruction kind of energy. Okay. Okay. And the thing about the galactic center is that because it has the highest ether, you know, the here, if this is our, our little tiny 
tiny, wee little tiny solar <laughs> system, right? <laughs> And we're, they stuck us way out in the back 40 because, you know, we're crazy and they want to keep us away from everybody. So <laughs> they put our, our little solar system out here. And if this is the galactic plane that's coming straight out, right, from the galactic center, then as we travel, as we travel through the galactic plane, we're at, at golden age, we're at Satya Yuga. As we start to leave away from the galactic center, or the galactic plane, then we hit uh, Treta Yuga, and then Dwarp, uh, Dwarpara Yuga, and then Kali is when we're at the farthest point away from the galactic plane. And then it's a sine wave, right? So then we start descending back down, and it does the same thing backwards. And then we hit the, the galactic plane, and then we're here again. And then it's this constant going up and down, uh, you know, how much ether are we receiving from the galactic center? That's what it's all that's about. True. That's true. And when you talk about galactic center, you mean the central sun? Of our Milky Way, okay. our galactic core. And what they, they know now is that it's basically empty. It's the highest concentration of, of you know, energy in our whole galaxy. Mm -hmm. But they thought that it was like full of storms and all this, but now they've, they've I was just seeing this uh, NASA release that they think that it's actually completely empty. And it's probably, I think this is, it's got the energy of the black hole. I don't, I mean, you know, Thunderbolt Project people, the electric um, universe theory people, they don't believe, believe in black holes. They say they are more like wormholes, you know? Um, so that energy is present there, but that's the highest concentration of ether that we have in our galaxy. So us, it's all about how are we receiving that? And it takes millions of years for us to do this and go all the way no, around. I, the I, that is true. So speaking of that, Katya, which uh, age are we? Do you know by any chance? Like well, there's two different schools of thought. The traditional school of thought says that we are in the Kali Yuga and the, um, which puts us in relationship to the galactic center. But there's another school of thought that I think is from, uh, oh gosh, I forget. But the second one says that we are actually in Dwarpara, Bronze Age. So either way, it's a pretty low consciousness. And when it's when when we're when we're at really low consciousness, it only takes a little bit of spiritual effort to get great results because it's so dark. So any kind of you know prayer, any kind of spirituality we do during this time will be magnified because it's so dark. Where's the opposite? When it's the golden age, it takes a lot of spiritual practice because it's it's so spiritual. It takes so much to like become even more spiritual. You know what I mean? Right, right. Because it actually like a telepathy is basically natural if you're if you would be in a golden age. Right. So that's the difference. So I, I think based on the way I see it, uh, Katya, so Kali uh, is iron, which means it's the lowest um, frequency wise, and then it's Dwapara, and then it's Treta Yuga, and then it's golden. I um, mean Satya Yuga, right? So that's the uh, that's the way they are kind of evolving yeah you, and you see here in the middle he put descending ascending so right. it's going yeah right. so, so if you're in kali or dwapara where i mean dwapara is a little bit better than kali so i, I guess i don't <laughs> i don't mind that we are there because let's just at least uh, fake it till you make it so one one thing that you mentioned earlier too and i found this chart so i wanted to throw this nakshatra, nakshatra which is like at the heart of this vedic astrology and it is the term for the lunar mansion, uh, basically. And it is uh, one of the 28, and you said uh, 27, right? Depending on uh, sectors. And uh, this- Yeah, I mean, the, the mystical 28th is Abhijit. It belongs to Krishna um, and there's stories around it. But basically if we use 28, it, it, we wouldn't have the perfect symmetry. Right, right. The, uh, the ecliptic, right? Because yeah, because in order to create that proper uh John well, in order to create fourth 108 432 we need to have 27 nakshatras so. <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's how that number comes up and um i know you're going to go more detail into your chart so this was the last chart that i wanted to show from my end i found this 
And this one, of course, shows that Earth location in 2012. Yes. Uh, so based on that, they were showing that we were right there. And um, as you can see that... Um, oh, here. Yeah. See, they took us... See those bands, you guys? See, it's like spiral bands. We're like on the third band out. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So that... They're like, keep these crazy people away. Yeah, we basically have a little bit of a way to go for our ascension as we... Well, yeah, I mean, so if we're... I think we're about... See, this is, you know, some people say, oh, the Mayan calendar was us being aligned with the galactic plane. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that's what they meant when they were talking about the calendar <laughs> ended. Right. Um, I think we're about 2,000 years. Let's see, I think it's 6,000 6, up. Uh, yeah, 6,000 down. So it's a 12 year, 12,000 year cycle. Okay. 12, so I think we're about half halfway up. So we're like 2000 years into a six year, 6,000 year cycle, right. I think. But who knows? I mean, my God, <laughs> this is going to go on and on and on. Everyone thinks it's the end times. Everyone always thinks it's the end times, <laughs> <So> you guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think the bottom line of what I was just showing you was that it does matter where earth is. It does matter where sun is. It does matter where moon is. It does matter where we are. And everything- You are here. <laughs> Everything is interconnected and Vedic astrology kind of gives you a little bit of a peek in your life with respect to everything around you. And that's why somebody like you who does the reading would be a good, everybody needs to just get a reading so they can have that information about themselves. And then the very fact that everything does affect everything and even our ascension is very affected by where earth is and sun is, we just have to accept the fact that we do have a lot more going on than we understand at all. Hey, look, these, these charts play out like a book. <laughs> this is, well, I do Vedic astrology because every time I do somebody's chart, I'm blown away. I mean, it works so well. It blows my mind. And I'm one of those people that I like to be in that shock and awe all the time. <laughs> really? Oh, dude, that's so cool. <laughs> exactly yes yes so yes please Katya whenever you feel like go ahead and share okay, yeah. what you have collected I mean, when you see how it plays out I mean you can't make this stuff up you guys <laughs> it's just it's absolutely amazing um so I'm gonna just uh this is a actually a presentation I put together for excuse me gift of light expo which I do you guys in Ohio um the spring one, I'm not going to do. We had to change the date because of COVID again, uh, and the new date didn't work out for me. So probably I'll be there in November, but she, you know, she might do, I have a feeling she'll do something this summer because um, people are just itching to, you know, get back into work again. Um, so hopefully we'll have a Gift of Light Expo this summer, but um, I presented this last year. So at the end, it does have last year's information, but I'll update it for now because it's, easy. Oh, this is my, um, my intro. So you can see, there we are. That's us. <laughs> yes. And it actually shows, uh, Katia, the sinusoidal wave you were talking about earlier. Exactly. Yes. And that's my friend Epco. Uh, he gave me permission to use that. And if you, um, I'll actually send you the links to this because it's really good for people to see how we're moving around, you know, the galactic center. Yes, please do. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, Jyotisha, here's the Sanskrit. Vedic astrology from India, known as Jyotisha, translates as the science of light. It is a system of knowledge based on the oral tradition called the Vedas. There are four Vedas and they are the exposition of pure spiritual knowledge. They are the Rig Veda. Uh, the Rig Veda is like the main hymns uh, for deities and things like that. The Sama Veda, uh, the Yajur Veda, and the Atharva Veda. Atharva Veda is um, like uh, a lot of Ayurvedic remedies, um, you know, things to help you with everyday life. Samaveda is um, a lot of the, uh, the music and talks about frequencies of, you know, scales and things and how they work. 
Uh, and then Yajur Veda, I think, is more prayer, prayer hymns. It has been passed on as an oral tradition for thousands of years, some say around 50,000 years. Uh, the Rig Veda hymns in the Devangari, and it's not, <laughs> my Sanskrit teacher is so funny. He's like, it's not Dave and Gary. I mean, not that we don't like Dave and Gary, but <laughs> Dave and Gary, uh, Sanskrit uh, with English translation. So this is just a little bit of expert. I won't play the whole thing. Little excerpt from um, some rishis or priests um, chanting the, the Vedas. So you can see, you know, they are, uh, you know, they're chanting the Veda, but it's like a song, right? And they're talking about Brahma, they're describing him. Uh, like I said, Rig Veda are basically praise hymns for, for the deities at first. Wow. Now, Jyotisha are the eyes of the Veda. The functional names of the Vedas are collections of six scientists, sciences called Vendangans, which represent different parts of the body of the Vedas. Siska is the science of Sanskrit sounds, and it represents the nose. Kalpa is the science of Vedic rituals. It represents the head. Vyakarana is the science of Sanskrit grammar, and it represents the mouth. Nirukta is the science of Sanskrit etymology and meaning of words, and it represents the ears. Chanda is the science of the rules of chanting the Veda, and it represents the feet. And Jyotisha, the science of astrology, represents the eyes of the Veda. It represents the eyes of the Veda because it helps people to see ahead in time. Jyot means light and Ish means God, Jyotisha. So as a practicer, you are a Jyotishi. That makes sense. <laughs> the six branches of Jyotisha. There are six branches of Jyotisha. Gola, or positional astronomy. This uh, calculates the movements of the celestial bodies. Ganita, the mathematical diagnostics of Gola. Jataka, or natal astrology, or Rashi birth chart analysis. That's mainly what I do is, is Jataka. Prashna, or horror astrology, answers the question the moment it is asked. Prashna, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with. I think if you rely too much upon Prashna, it can kind of be a portal for confusion. Because everything you need to know is in the transits. And so if you're asking a Prashna question, you're asking, um, you pull up a chart of the transits the moment it's asked. And the theory is that the answer is in that chart rather than looking at the person's natal chart and figuring out where transits are on top of that. You know, prashna is kind of like tarot. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> Mahurta, this is electional astrology. It selects the best time to do certain activities such as get married. Right. And Nimitta, this deals with omens indicating upcoming events. So the way Nimitta works is, let's say I'm giving you a reading and we're talking about something really important and then the phone rings. Like right as we say the really important thing and we go, oh, that was a confirmation, yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. That's Nimitta. And so, you know, really you have, to, you have to understand all of these things, you know, to understand Jyotisha. Um, you know, it used to be before software that we had to calculate all of our charts by hand. Wow. All of the math. So you had to understand positional astronomy. You had to understand the math behind finding this stuff. And if you couldn't do those first two things, guess what? <laughs> you couldn't do astrology. <laughs> you yeah. had to have somebody else do it for you. So we're so lucky we have software today because I am not a math person. Yeah, you know, yeah. One, 
one of the things you got me thinking was that, you know how like a lot of people who don't understand astrology in general, they think that that just seems like a voodoo. And when you really look at everything that you're explaining here, it makes you realize that they went through so many um, layers and layers to uncover. Okay. Understanding. Yes, you're absolutely right. But here's the thing. What they don't understand is how those things in the sky affect us. <laughs> I have, a, I have a friend that is a NASA scientist as well. She works at, a, at an observatory and she got her PhD here at IU and we used to go round and round about this. I love her dearly, but she's like, I, I'm like, honey, as above, so below. It's yeah. called quantum entanglement. You know, it's, you know, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. <laughs> he even, he couldn't figure it out. Why, it, you know, when two... Uh, when a particle is separated, why is this one responding when this one, how do they have that communication? It's the magnetic field. We are in the same magnetic bubble. Our whole solar system is in the same magnetic bubble. Right. So how could we not affect each other? And this is also though my argument for why I think we need to include the outer planets because Western astrology, I mean, I'm sorry, Vedic astrology traditionally does not use the outer planets. Because their thinking was that um, it's only what we can see in the sky that affects us. But after using the outer planets in Western astrology, I know they work. I know they work. And my thinking is that it's because it's a, we're, it's a, uh, our solar system works holistically. Right. And when you kind of rely on what you can see in the sky, then you are very much limited because... What you can see in the sky depends on the technology and depends on your electromagnetic spectrum. So that is a very limited way of thinking. And yeah, well, yeah. So that's why I consider myself a neo-Vedic astrologer. <laughs> because I take the best of Western and then I put it into Vedic. Because as you said, you know, Vedic's the mothership. Western astrology is about 10% of Vedic. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you got to learn the whole thing, you know. Right. Okay, so here we go. The difference between Western and Vedic astrology. Here are some major differences between the two systems. The zodiac signs or Rashi signs don't match up due to the Ayanamsha, which is the zodiac calculation method based on the tilt or axis of the planet, which results in the precession of the equinoxes. Western uses the tropical zodiac, which aligns with the seasons and has nothing to do with the stars. Vedic uses the sidereal zodiac or the astronomer zodiac and uses the actual positions of the stars. The difference between the two is the Ayanamsha and it can be calculated differently. I use the Lahiri. It's the most common. A lot of people use Chitrapaksha as well, but so this just gives you a visualization. So this is us, right? Flying through space. We're tilted here, right? Mm -hmm. So the difference between here and here, well, they here it says 23 and a half. We're actually, Lahiri now is at 24 degrees, eight minutes is where we're, the difference between the two systems right now. And it's going to keep going backwards. It's going to keep going, it's going to keep widening. Um, so if you were to take this out and make the planet upright, then that would be taken out, it'd be a zero, and that's the tropical zodiac. When the planet is upright, it aligns it with the sun. Mm. So that's the difference between the two. So that's why, you know, if in Western, your sun is in Cancer, it probably will fall back to Gemini. Now there is a seven degree overlap or now a six degree overlap between the two systems. So if you're born between about the 14th and the 22nd of any month, you're going to be the same sun sign in both Vedic and Western. Lucky you. <laughs> you can read the newspaper and it actually makes sense. You know, the, the zodiac in the newspaper, you know what I mean? Right. Okay. So Vedic is a lunar-based astrology, uh, while Western is a solar. Therefore, in Vedic, your moon sign is the most important, not the sun sign. Vedic uses the lunar mansions or the nakshatras. These are two and a half parts of each Rashi sign and correspond to the constellations. Predictive techniques that we use are the Dasha and the Ashtakavarga, um, which are used by Vedic, but not by Western. 
uh, the Dasha system is a planetary life system, and it is the blueprint that you wrote with Creator before you came into this life about how your life was going to flow. And I'm telling you, it plays like a book, <laughs> and it blows people's minds. They sit there with their jaw open because they can't believe that on that day they got married, boom, they started that, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it just... Ashtaka Varga means division of eight, and basically it, it just tells... It tells you how um, how the planet, how strong the planets are for you as they transit each year. You know, like how many points do you get? Like for instance, Donald Trump, he had um, while Jupiter was in Sagittarius, he got like six points out of eight, which is very very good for Jupiter in Sagittarius. So he was strong up during that that time. As soon as Jupiter went into Capricorn. He got one point in his Ashtaka Varga and everything went to hell in a handbasket. Wow. So that just shows the strength of the Ashtaka Varga. Drishti means to see or to glance. These are the Vedic aspects of the planets. They are different than in Western. So like Western aspects are, um, you know, sextile trine, uh, quincunx, opposition, conjunction. So they're all based on pretty much elements. Um, Vedic aspects are a little bit different. We, we do use some of the, what we call the, um, the Western aspects we actually call um, uh, uh, Tajik, Tajika aspects, because they come from Iran, they're Persian aspects. And actually uh, Western as we know it really came from Iran because it was a solar, solar based system and, and the ancient uh, Persians were um, Zoroastrians. They were very concerned about the sun. <laughs> and so, so when, you know, Alexander the Great came to Iran and conquered it, and he didn't just burn down Perse Persepolis, he also burned down Persian astrology because he took back a lot of that knowledge and took it to Greece, and then Ptolemy kind of ran with it, and that became Western. So, yeah, we have a lot, lot of uh, things to are, are uh, due to the ancient Persians. So those are the drish, the aspects. Uh, yogas or planetary combinations are different than in Western. Western. So there are certain combinations of um, like a Lakshmi yoga, you know, uh, Venus in her own sign, first house strong, ninth house strong. Some say it has to be in a kindrel, trichoda. I don't agree. So the, a yoga is like has has different names, different planetary combination. Uh, Raj yoga, for instance. Grahas, this is to grasp. In Vedic, these are the planets and they have consciousness. The planets are enlightened beings, not just rocks or balls of gas in the sky. So, so when we say a graha, remedial measure, that means that we're doing something like a mantra or a gemstone or something to make that planet better in our chart. Yeah, so get used to the word graha. We, I, I, we throw it around and I forget a lot of people don't know what we're talking about. So <laughs> the lunar mansion. So this is the picture of the lunar mansions. Um, you know, if, if you look closely, you can see like this is the constellation of Aries. And in Aries, we have Ashwini, Barani, Kritika. Um, and they're the different stars that go with them. The star that goes with Kritika uh, is the Pleiades. Wow. So if you think you're Pleiades, you probably have something in Kritika. <laughs> uh, Pisces, uh, Purva Bhadrapada, Uttara Bhadrapada, Bhadrapada uh, Revati. And so you see there's three for each one. And we say two and a half because uh, the way it's divided up is two equal portions and then one that is split between two signs. So there are a few that, that, um, that span two signs like... Um, Uttara, no, 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 where did it go? Here, Uttara Falguni spans both Leo and Virgo. Chitra spans both um, Virgo and Libra. So it's very, it's just, it, I love studying the stars. I'm just, to me, this is where it's at because before the 12 zodiac signs, there were the 27 nakshatras. 
before the 27 nakshatras, because you guys, you got to realize these are all lined up on the ecliptic, right? Right. They're lined up on the path that the planets follow. But there are all these other stars <laughs> that are off the ecliptic. Yeah. And I think they matter too. And so do the Arabs. And that just happens to be the language that I studied when I was in ethnomusicology. I took two years of Arabic. I can read and write it. And so when I'm reading about all of the other stars that are off the ecliptic, it makes so much sense to me. That's amazing. Yeah, so that, to me, it's, it's really all about the stars and it's about observation. And, you know, like we were saying before, it's not about um, anthropomorphizing the sky or superimposing human stories <laughs> onto the sky. Yes, of course, we're using that as a basis, but it's, it's about observation. So, right. you know, like the ancients noticed, gee, in April, when the Pleiades is overhead at night, at least in, north, in the Northern hemisphere, like Europe, uh, it's raining all the time. So they associate crying and rain with Pleiades, with Kritika. Mm -hmm. And Kritika, the myth of that is about Kartikeya. Kartikeya is the son of Shiva and Parvati. And he um, was, a, was wounded and the seven sisters of the Pleiades took care of him, but their father accused them of adultery. And so they wept and cried because they knew that it wasn't true. And so those stories and myths are all, you know, it's all about the deity of the nakshatra and the story. And so that's how these things came to be. It wasn't that we just randomly named things, you know, they, things were happening when they saw those stars. They meant something. They knew when uh, the star Antares, you know, which is, um, in, it's down here in Jaistra, it's the star of Jaistra, um, when that star, and then the star that goes with um, Rohini, Aldebaran, when those were prominent in war leaders' charts, they knew that uh, who was going to win and who was going to lose, because whoever had Aldebaran was the winner. So they used these things. You see, they knew how they operated. So I, I, it's like the universe was speaking to us, not that we were forcing our theory onto it. I yeah. think that's important for people to understand. Right. And then this is just a picture of the nakshatras with um, the pictures. Right. Um, and so, like I said, I do neo-Vedic astrology. So Vedic only uses visible planets, the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, and the comets such as Chiron are not used. Neo-Vedic uses them. The nodes of the moon are used differently in Vedic. The north node is called Rahu and the south node is called K2. They are considered planets, but they are really shadow points and re reveal to us hidden things. So when the eclipses happen, they always reveal things that were in the shadow previously. The Vargas, these are the divisional or harmonic charts in Vedic. And this is where it gets really cool. This is where each house is opened up and there are 60 charts. So you have your basic birth chart, right? That's 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 called D1. Underneath D1, there are 60 charts. I tell you all these different things about yourself. Wow. Uh, the most important divisional chart besides the D1 birth chart is the D9, as this shows the spouse of the individual, but also who the person becomes. Isn't it interesting that the person we grow to be is what we attract in a mate? Right. So that means the law of attraction. That's exactly what the concept right. behind law of attraction is. Which but is also, you know, in antiquity, you married young <laughs> and you stayed with that person your whole life. So you grew to be like each other as you aged. Right. So that was also part of the theory as to why, you know, you become your D9 chart. You become your spouse's chart. Because yeah. you become your spouse after you're with them. For... And it's funny, Katya, yeah, I've noticed that some spouse who are together for a very long time, they start looking like each other too. <laughs> it's kind of amazing, right? Not just that. Yes. They're... Right. It's, it's, I mean, it's Absolutely. It's That's true. precisely but... the idea. And it's a classic example of how everything affects everything. Yes. Now, the Upaya Graha Shanti Remedial Astrology. Vedic prescribes different treatments for afflicted planets. Gemstones and mantras are prescribed, but there are also sorts of various rituals you can do for any life problem. So 
this is a great time for me to announce that I have a new product coming out uh, and they are uh, Graha Remedial Elixirs. Hmm. And what I've done is I've put together, um, cause I, you know, I've been working with essential oils for a long time um, and fragrance as well. And I've studied what is good for each planet. So I'm making um, an elixir that's like a water-based elixir. And then I'm making an oil-based one that's, you know, for massage or perfume or something. And I've made it so that um, it is um, helping to rectify, or not rectify, but to improve that planet. So like if you have, um, if you have Mars debilitated, you have the inability to relax. And so, um, the Mars elixirs help you to grapple Mars and to help him to relax and to bring out his best qualities. Very cool. So this will be coming out uh, probably in the next, or really in the next week, next next two weeks. I'm going to give myself a little bit extra time, but in about two weeks, let's say. <laughs> so check my website because my those products will be coming out. And then also I have... Um, my friend, um, Sherry Lynn, who does the um, cosmic healing discs, uh, she's making me some discs that are um, just for me to sell um, that have to do with the grahas and how to improve uh, and focus on the grahas as you are doing your mantras, right? So for instance, uh, you were talking about the flower of life today, and this is Sherry's flower of light disc. Um, this is a light that goes with it. That looks cool. Yes, I see it. So basically, um, you know, these can be used, you know, you can hold them as you're, as you're chanting um, you can also put them on your chart, uh, and that's actually something that we're working on is um, encapsulating people's charts in the same glass, and that way you have your chart preserved, and then you can put the different discs on the different um, houses that you have afflicted, you know, to rest, and then while you're doing your mantras, you can take them off. Right. Um, so those are those are some products that I'm going to have on my website very soon, and I'm very excited to share it with you guys because I think that um, you know gemstones, the ones that are that are the good ones, they're like thousands of dollars, and I don't think you have to spend thousands of dollars to um, remedy your planets. I think that. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it, you know, uh, with a lot less and, um, and it makes you feel better. It's all about mood enhancing, you know, it's all about changing your emotions because all disease comes from emotion. Okay. So this was last year, actually. Um, this is about Shawnee, but I wanted to show you, um, What's going on for um, this year? Because right now, you know, we had that Saturn um, Jupiter conjunction, which was December 21st of last year. And um, now Saturn is uh, in Shravana. So you see these are the nakshatras of Saturn. I mean, you have um, Capricorn and Aquarius. Right now, Saturn uh, just left Uttara Shad. He's in Shravana now. And he just was conjunct the sun. Um, and uh, Jupiter is in Shravana now. So actually, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to show you on the software what's going on. So here we are. So this is today. Okay, so that's exactly right now where all the planets are. <laughs> so you can see, you know, the exact conjunction of Jupiter and, and Saturn was uh, December 21st. But you can see they're still together. They're gonna be together for a while. Sun is there now. 
when Sun and Saturn come together, that's like um, really low self-esteem. It's a lot of pressure, you know? Um, Sun is the superstar of our solar system. So he puts everybody in his shadow, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Saturn already is a dark planet. He already has low self-esteem. So when he's in Sun's shadow, he really feels... Uh, so if you're feeling depressed, the, like yes, especially yesterday, today, it's not just you. It's everybody right now. Um, so just, I just, when I start to feel that way, you know, do your mantras. Do your mantras. And I, I have uh, the, you know, channels that I like to look at on YouTube that have beautiful videos that go with the mantras and it's like music and you know, it doesn't feel like a chore, you know, this just feels like you're um, singing. <laughs> right. no, and that's what I love about mantras, because I love to sing. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, Saturn just went into the United States um, second house. Let me open this up. The United States chart. So you can see, here's our ascendant in the United States. Uh, the birth time is July 4th, 1776 at 6.30 p.m. And James Kelleher actually went into the library where, where this information was held and took three months of research and found out the exact time that they signed the Declaration of Independence and it was 6.30 p.m. So Saturn just went into our second house of money. So you can see there's all this heaviness here Pluto, you know, planet of death. We're going to have our Pluto return. You see United States Pluto is here. So in 2023, it's going to come here. The United States is in down here. You see the Dasha cycle of Rahu Jupiter. So it's karmic right now, what we're going through. We're also in what's called Sati Sati. I'm sorry, sorry I'm sorry, Rahu Saturn. That was today. Uh, United States is in Rahu Saturn. Now, when transit Saturn goes by your moon in your birth chart, that's a seven period, um, seven year period called Sati Sati. And basically this is um, when Saturn is coming to uh, see, you know, it's, it's almost like a Saturn return, but it's like um, you're being tested. Saturn is tested, testing you. And it's um, a time when he puts you through um, a lot of work, but if you pass it, then he leaves you a gift at the door. So it's when Saturn is in the sign before your moon, the sign of your moon and the sign after your moon. So it's a seven year period and the United States just started this <laughs> like last year. And so we've got all this crazy stuff going on right now and the Pluto return on top of it um, so yeah, I'm just telling people just, you know, hang tight, you know, we, we got through this. Now these planets are going to go up, up into Aquarius. Saturn won't be in Aquarius till next year, but, um, this summer, what we will have is, we'll go by month and just show you. So that's the end of February. Um, March, and then by April, Jupiter is going to be in Aquarius and conjunct Neptune, and that's going to be great up until June when he goes retrograde. And then when he goes retrograde, he's going to go back into Capricorn, and that's probably so. April to, to um, April to June is going to be really good. Um, we're going to feel like we're getting away from the pandemic. Things are going to be good, and then as soon as Jupiter goes back retrograde and it goes back into Capricorn, the pandemic's going to come back by September. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's, we're going to, because Jupiter's debilitated in Capricorn and we get a sense of false hope when Jupiter's in Capricorn. Um, so until he goes like November, yeah, it was like November, yeah, November 20th, yep, 21st, he's going to go back into Aquarius, and then things will be better. We'll be away from the pandemic by that point. Okay, so it seems like April to June, 
and then November onward. Take advantage of the time. <laughs> Go travel. Get your hair done. You know, do all that stuff. That's like, you know, really, um, you know, stuff that we haven't been able to do. You know, like go out and do it because um, after that, it's gonna, it's not gonna be as much fun. Right. So, afraid. Uh, Katya, you had a one chart that was showing something about one zero eight, because I know a lot of people are always interested in that. If you can just uh, go to that chart. It had a title set something about 108. But well, I combined my intro to Vedic astrology with the Saturn. Oh, you know what it was? It was it was a mantra. Oh, yeah, it was just a mantra. Yeah, it was a Saturn mantra, was all it was. Oh, okay, got yeah, it. All of the mantras you should do 108 times. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to sit and laboriously chant it and be miserable. No, that's the beautiful thing about the grahas and the deities. They're very actually forgiving. Even if you just chant a couple lines, they're like, oh, good job. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you said the mantra because, you know, we have tazbi in our, in my culture, because, you know, I'm born raised Muslim and the beats are 108 for, for that reason. So, oh my gosh. It's all embedded in everything. That's the, that's the thing that I'm understanding now as much as I go deep dive then I start it's seeing science. it's in nature you know what I mean it's not even just a religious thing right yes um so so this is was from last year 2021 January 13th Saturn transits the cusp of the U.S. second house that just happened right. and then March 17th uh, Saturn transits um our K2 so yeah it's just gonna be doom and gloom for a while you guys I'm sorry <laughs> but until Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah this is what is going to be fantastic so the first one annular solar eclipse october 14th 2023 starts in texas those over the west coast total solar eclipse april 8th 2024 starts in, you know for us in texas goes right over my house <laughs> that is so cool and so this these are the charts for those eclipses so you know, the first one, Saturn will be retrograde um, on top of our moon. That's The first one's going to be kind of tough, I think. This one is going to be kind of tough. But this one, all those planets in Pisces, I think that's fantastic. <laughs> that's Neptune in Pisces, Venus, Rahu, Sun, Moon. Oh, my God. Spiritual revolution. I really, <laughs> I think these four years are us building up to... Um, you know, kind of a, a spiritual um, breakthrough for the United States. We yeah. just have to be careful of not giving away our sovereignty. It's all about claiming personal and national sovereignty and not letting people push us around, you know? Right. And 2024 is the year when my project is sending the woman to walk on the moon. So you can just imagine that we are actually going to grow leaps and bounds in all aspects of our lives spiritual growth this is massive spiritual growth and what would that be for the planet spiritual growth that would be contacting other planets being in a spiritual community and us finding life you know on these other planets that's that's going to be the um the clincher to all of this i think because pisces is actually the sign of travel and there's a different way you can divide the signs called the Drekanas. And Drekana, and it's the, the D3 chart as well in, in uh, Vedic astrology. And the Drekana chart uh, divides the sign into three parts. And one of the Drekanas for Pisces actually speaks of travelers coming from many nations. Wow. And yeah, and it's just many, many... Look, our definition of life is very narrow. And until we start looking for life, other kinds of life, we're going to be kind of disappointed. So, <laughs> Right. We have to open our horizon on how we uh, see and perceive other being existence. Exactly. It's all the lens we're looking through. It's all epistemology, you know. How do you know what you know? Well, it's the lens you're looking through. So this is what it, I think it's all leading up to. 
Um, but you guys don't go out and watch it. <laughs> it's very bad luck. It's very, very, very bad luck to go out and watch the eclipse. I think that's why all this crap has happened in the United States because everybody went outside to watch the eclipse in 2017. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> so don't look at it. <laughs> do your mantras. You're supposed to stay inside and do your mantras and don't eat any un um, leftovers on the day of the eclipse. Hmm. Yeah, only eat uh, freshly cooked food. Yeah. yeah. That should be the case all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, some things are better like soup and stuff if they sit for a day. But you're yeah. not supposed to have that, you know, for the eclipse. So if you want to book a reading with me, just go to uh, hindustanastrology.com and just click on the um, consultation tab that's at the top. Um, and you just want to go to the first time reading, which is the birth chart reading. Uh, but it should all be on there. And, um, and of course, I'm, I'm not on Facebook, but I am on Instagram under Hindustan Astrology. And I'm on Pinterest as well. Uh, and on LinkedIn, too. So you can always find me there. Wow, that's amazing. That was so informative and so interesting that how much, you know, you have to understand to come up with some, you know, come up with the reading, right, for your clients and the very fact that you're so, I mean, this is like part of your existence, like the way you understand it, the way you live it, the way you explain it. So coming to you for the reading like that is like you are, you are the right person, uh, you know, knowledge wise and understanding wise and living wise. And I think everybody should get a yearly reading. I mean, that would be my thing, because that's where you just have a little bit of a forecast about your life and you kind of have an idea just like you said for example that you know if we, if anybody was feeling bad yesterday for example then there was a good reason for it so it just helps you kind of make sense out of things absolutely and then when you see how affected you are and then you it's like well that's i felt that because i'm sensitive you know that's a good thing right right because i've already noticed whenever the weather is like really like overshadowed then i feel it like I feel differently, right? So I can't, you can start seeing your own personal patterns. But I think when people like our ancestor who has done this incredible amount of work, right? To make us, to give us some sense in our life. I mean, I think that people need to start availing that rather than the media and other sources that completely distracts us and sometimes even uh, compromises us in a way that we are no longer functioning at the higher frequency and the higher vibration. So yeah, no, I think what you, that was amazing. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down the links for everyone to access you. You've already mentioned everything else. Um, is there anything else you would like to say before we say goodbye? Um, well, I would just say, you know, check out um, uh, the Raj Shree Soul. Let me just show you the Raj Shree Soul uh, YouTube channel that I do on, um, you know, to get all of my mantras and things. Um, Let's see, because it's important, I think, for people to understand, like. This is uh, one of the ones for Ganesh. So what I do, um, this is my favorite channel. This is the one, like my go-to channel, okay? So I go to Rajshree Soul. I go to playlists. Uh, they have different, this is all of them, but you know, they have different ones. Um, and you can see like, um, that's Diwali. That's a Ganesh. Um, another Ganesh. So uh, yeah, Ganesh. So this is the one that I like the best. And so let's see. And get a good one going. And what the way I do this is I get up in the morning, I take care of the dogs, take my medicine, blah, 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 I get my coffee, check my email, and I turn on my mantras, you know? And this is my way of um, clearing my head. It cleans your house out. And let me tell you, you cannot you cannot be depressed and do your mantras at the same time it's impossible so if you're feeling depression 
That's because you're not doing your mantras or you're not doing your prayers, you know, and whatever, if you are a strict Muslim, do your Islamic prayers. You cannot be depressed and do your prayers at the same time. The two frequencies can't exist in the same moment. And so these songs get into you. And why would you do Ganesh? Well, you would do Ganesh. Um, Ganesh is associated with uh, Uttara Ashada Nakshatra and Capricorn, and he's associated with Ketu. You have afflictions there in your chart, you would want um, Ganesh. You always do Ganesh first. Um, if you have, you know, like I said, Mars debilitated, you want to do um, either, you know, things for Mars or the sign that Mars is in, which is Cancer. So Chandra, the moon. Um, you know, which ones you do for each um, planet you know, really, it depends on your own ear. And so that's why I want, I don't want to just say, okay, you have to do this one and you have to do that one. No, I want you to go to the I want you to listen to it like music. And then you find, oh gosh, that sounds so good to me. I wonder why that's, I must need that. It's medicine. And so when I, you know, cause a lot of people say, oh, don't prescribe mantras to Americans. They won't do them. <laughs> Right, so because you know what? they will do them if you if you approach it like that, you know, and say just listen to it, just listen to it. You don't have to do every single word; it's not a chore. Yeah, you you are actually will know which one vibrates with you because you know we have our we have our unique tone, and there is certain things that resonates with us, and that actually applies to all the music because there is a reason certain people like certain music and certain people may not even like the exact. You know, I mean, even if it's a couple, they always sometimes have because we all are different. We all have different tones and we have different way. Uh, and also we are also within ourselves, we're in a different mood within 24 hours a day. So sometimes exactly. the very thing you like, you may not like the other time. So it's very interesting how it's all intertwined. And uh, yeah, so I think that it's pretty amazing. So what you were showing just now to everyone was that if they want to get some free mantras, access to free mantras, that is a very good one-stop shop where they can go and check it out. And they can even make that as part of their daily rituals if they want, because Absolutely. it would help them with, uh, you know, with just the very fact that everything affects everything. And this, these are designed specifically. Keeping yes, that's the beauty of the Vedas is that, you know, these priests knew thousands of years ago what frequency what went with which planet. And so we don't have to figure that out. All we have to do is do the mantra. So, I mean, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> it's like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. That, that's very amazing. So, well, thank you, Katya, for all of this education, training, um, enlightenment, um, and also giving us like a forecast on United States of America so everybody can have a little idea, especially people are a little concerned about this year. So I think it seems like we do have a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not going to be that far off. We just have to hang tight and just know ourselves and maybe uh, avail the reading with you so they can have a little bit of idea about their unique situation this year and so forth. So I think I'm very excited about all of this being shared. And um, well, I wish everybody a very good night or evening or afternoon, wherever you are or whenever you're listening. And <laughs> thank, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you much.